morning and welcome to River Oaks Presbyterian Church. My name is Josh Holstein. I'm the youth pastor here and we're excited that you're here. And this time is the time that we take to reorient our hearts and remind ourselves that we're constantly distracted. I don't know if you're suffering from the fake fall that we got early this morning, this week, and now it's 105 degrees or whatever it is. We're here because a sovereign God wants to give us himself. And that's what we're remembering during this time. So if you would be able to stand and hear this call to worship. This morning comes from Hebrews chapter 13. And it says, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Would you pray with me? Father, it is you this morning that we come to worship. It is you this morning that we come to know. And you promise us rest and security. You reveal yourself as wisdom, grace, justice, comfort, and peace. We are content in your presence this morning because you are eternal and you uphold your promise to never leave us. Lord, we desire our hearts to be turned to you, the one that is truth and the word of life. And we come boldly to your throne this morning in anticipation for you to speak, in anticipation for your spirit to renew us, in anticipation for you to reveal yourself to us. Overwhelm us this morning with your majestic glory. Move our hearts to see that true joy is found only in you. We pray all this in your son's most glorious name. Amen. confess our sins, not because we're unsure if God will forgive us, but because we're sure that he is a loving God and does forgive. And we don't want to hide anything from a God who's like that. Well, let's pray. Our risen and sovereign King, 
You are the source of life, the way of truth, the conquering king who leads his people in giving life and peace to the nations. And we recognize, Lord, that you have created each of us in your image with a specific calling to serve you and to serve the world, doing the work that you have given us to do in schools, business, government, churches. But we confess, Father, that we have not often fulfilled our callings. Many of us, like Jonah, have run from your calling. Others of us have strayed from our call for the lure of more money. Still others of us have only given half an effort to fulfill the calling you've given us, giving up when it got hard or required faith and perseverance. Father, forgive us and renew us in our desire to follow you. We're grateful that you never give up on your people, that your goodness and loving kindness pursue us all the days of our lives. And we thank you that Jesus took up his calling to represent us in life and in death, that his heart was always in everything that he did, and that he is even now interceding for us at your right hand. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Having confessed our sins, please stand and hear this good news from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing, Thy mercy, my God, is the theme of my song.
Church, thank you so much for getting up and worshiping with us and braving the heat and uh, all the things. That's the last. I'm gonna try to go the rest of the day without mentioning the heat. I think we're all aware of it. Um, we have little pads on the ends of the roads. If you'd like to let us know how we can be praying for you or how you uh, we can be in contact with you, if you want us to contact you, that's the way to do it. Um, this is not. Uh, this is. What's that word? When everybody just disappears. The rapture. This is not the rapture. This is uh, children being taken to children's church. We have children's church up to the fifth grade today. If you would like to take your children there, there will be people out in the lobby 
<laughs> this is hilarious. There would be out, people out in the lobby to meet them and uh, to escort them to their classes. We also have um, nursing mother's rooms right, in, uh, right inside the nursery door. And I don't know, I call this the wiggle room. If you just get tired of holding your kid and you want to let him crawl around, you can take him in there. And we have a full nursery. We have all the things. So uh, make use of it how you will. I got uh, several uh, important announcements I'm really excited about. One I got to postpone. The one I'm most excited about, I'm postponing for one week. Come back next week. Um, sorry. But three or four exciting announcements. Number one is starting uh, this week, we'll have a uh, class on parenting. It's going to be Wednesday night, 630, right here in this sanctuary. You already know how to get there. Don't worry, I'm not teaching it. Um, Jonathan Dorst is teaching it, and so uh, he can teach you how to have good kids. Um, just kidding. My kids aren't here. I wouldn't say that. I've got two great kids. Um, but that will be 6.30 here in the sanctuary. We will have child care for you, so there's not... Um, I mean, it would be kind of harsh to have a parenting class without child care, right? So we didn't really want you to come. So anyway, that's here today. Uh, that's Wednesday nights at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. It'll go six weeks. Um, secondly, September 3rd, that's Labor Day weekend. Don't come. If you come to church at 9 in the morning, you've done the wrong thing. We will have worship at 1045 outside. It's supposed to be 83 degrees that day. At four in the morning, and no, just kidding. Um, it's supposed to be 83 degrees. It should be pleasant, we hope. And we're going to meet out in the the uh, grove. We're not going to feed you. We'll have drinks for you if you want to stay and have a picnic. Bring your picnic lunch. Pick up some uh, Jimmy Johns on the way, and uh, we will have that outside. At one service, 10:45, and we're going to have several children make their profession of faith that day. So if your kids have been waiting all summer to make a profession of faith and take their first communion, then that will be an opportunity to do that. I would like to meet with them in my office uh, before that to give them, just to ask them some questions. They don't have to understand the hypostatic union or anything, but just they need to know who Jesus is if they're going to eat his body and drink his blood. So um, ask them, you know, make an appointment with me. You can reach out to me through email or text. Or uh, I have a scheduler through WinWorks, or you can reach out to Brianna. Everybody's got uh, access to my calendar. Jonathan has access to my calendar. Bianca has access to my calendar. Everybody's got access to it. So everybody knows uh, where I'm doing and where I am. And finally, finally, um, oh, not finally, we also have elder nominations. This is the big Sunday, right? Everything's starting off. Elder nominations are open. We're going to open them up for about four weeks, and then I'm going to start training them. They, uh, the ballots are on the boxes, the black boxes on your way out the back doors. And they will, uh, on those, it, it reminds you what we're looking for in elders. And you can turn them over and write uh, the names of, of men that you think would make good elders. These are the guys that you would go to with problems. or guys that you think are raising their family well and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. These are uh, guys who you think are taking good care of their souls and would make good shepherds of, of the sheep. And so if you would like to nominate people, I would like to get six new elders. I would like to see the, the uh, session grow to 12. That seems to be the magic number. Um, and so I would like six new elders, and you are um, free to nominate who you will. And finally, a very important announcement. After a, what month is this? Eight. After an eight-month search, we have found uh, a new coordinator of women's ministry. We decided the job was too big that we separated into two. And so Charmaine Robbins has uh, been duly installed and, and, and whatever, interviewed and uh, selected by the session, approved by the session to be our coordinator of women's ministries. And Cheryl Owens has agreed to take uh, about a quarter of the job and be our uh, director of uh, assimilation and women's greeting and uh, basically the job of making sure everybody has a good first impression. So let's give them a round of applause, please. And so this puts me out of a job. I'm no longer the coordinator of women's ministry, so stop asking me about women because i got no answers. Um, now, we're very excited to have them, and I want to pray for them right now. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Charmaine and Cheryl. Thank you that they have been uh, really fulfilling this calling for years. 
that they have a love for this church and a love for the women in the church. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless their ministry. I pray that you would fill them with your spirit and anoint them for this calling, that they would um, just have a, a Holy Spirit awareness of who's hurting, of who needs a little extra attention, of how to uh, draw women into the ministry and when it's time to share the responsibility of ministry with other women. Father, would you uh, bless them, bless their houses, bless their homes, bless their, uh, their children and their husbands um, through your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. All right, so we're going to continue our series on uh, just the Frequently Asked Questions series. And this is the series we, we called, or I called, um, Three Lies and the Truth. Uh, the first week we talked about the truth, right? And basically the truth about the truth is that it exists. There is truth. We can know it. God is exi exists. He's made himself well known. He's not hiding. He's not uh, hiding under a rock somewhere that you, so that you have to descend to the depths to find him. He's not on top of a mountain somewhere so that you have to climb uh, to, to the great heights of Everest or whatever to find him. He is right here. He's within us, and he is all around us, and he's not hiding. But humans, we, the, the very pinnacle of his creation, we've suppressed that truth. We don't like that truth. And so we have exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And we, we've result, the result of that is we believe three enormous lies. We believe a million lies about God, but there are three enormous lies uh, that result, of this, uh, result from this suppression is the, the romantic or the sexual lie. It's uh, that there's a person out there who can fulfill you, that there's a a sexual thing out there that can fulfill you. Uh, Tim Keller has a book called Counterfeit Gods, and he talks about this. I, I've never heard this phrase before, but it's so shockingly accurate. He says most men live with the belief that there's a, an apocalyptic sex experience out there that will make them fulfilled. Um, it's an implicit belief. You don't really think that, but you kind of think that. And because you kind of think that, you always go around sad that you haven't had it yet. It, it doesn't exist. And so we talked about that last week. This week, we're going to talk about the happiness lie. And the happiness lie is that there is something out there that when you get it, you'll be happy. When you just get this. And it's, it's your lie, so I, don't, I can't necessarily come up with the words for you. But um, you'll know what your lie is when you just say the phrase, I'll be happy when... Whatever just came to your mind, that's your lie. So, what we're going to do is look at why those are lies. Why it's a lie to think that we're going to be fulfilled, that we're going to be uh, content, that we will have joy and peace when we just get that. As a way of introduction, I want to ask you this question. I found it interesting. Um, I got on the internet, well, I get on the internet hourly, um, but uh, I got on the internet today, and I asked myself the question, who do I think is the saddest person, whose life do I think was the saddest, uh, of the people, of the, you know, the famous people that we all know, and I came up with different, uh, different candidates, so you can decide who you think was the saddest, Amy Winehouse, Grammy winner, beautiful, beloved, Addicted, died at the age of 27 from alcohol poisoning. Famously wrote a song, they're trying to make me go to rehab, but I won't go, go, go. 27. Drank herself to death. That's sad. Whitney Houston's sadder, right? She has had all the beauty, all the fame, all the talent, all the money. Died of 48 from complications. Uh, she drowned in her bathtub. Uh, from probably had a cocaine-related heart attack and drowned in her bathtub. And, and by the time, she, before she died, she had done so many drugs and so much abuse that she, she had lost it, that beautiful voice. There's a billionaire named um, 
Kim Jong-ju, uh, Korean youngest uh, billionaire in Korea, um, invented, I think he created uh, well, one of those games that all of our kids play. He was uh, a, a multi-billionaire, way on up there, the third richest person in, in South Korea. Sounds like a lot. He, uh, he died in Hawaii, so not only was a, he a billionaire where there was nothing in the world that was too far out for him, but he was pretty much in paradise. He died in Hawaii, probably from suicide, seeking treatment for his depression. And then another one who honestly is, is my winner, you'll have to look him up if you want to know more, but his name is Ehud Lanier. He was a Belgian billionaire, multiple, multi-billionaire, about $200 billion, who died from complications for plastic surgery. Fascinating. Now, why do I bring these people up? Because I'm Ricky. If I tried to tell you that all the beauty in the world won't fulfill you, then you're going to go, how would you know? If I tried to tell you all the money in the world would try to fulfill you, you would be like, Ricky, you've got two nickels to rub together. You're a thousandaire. How would you know? If I tried to tell you that all the fame in the world won't fulfill you, you'd say, Ricky, you're the third most popular preacher on 101st between Sheridan and Yale. How would you know? And so I bring to you these people, Whitney Houston, Elvis, uh, billionaires, uh, artists, and, and there were miserable people who found life so hard, so depressing, that they had to rely on continual drug use to survive it, and it ultimately it killed them. And I'm bringing their ghosts in here in front of you to show you there is nothing out there that will fulfill you. It doesn't exist. The pursuit of happiness is a lie. There is not, happiness is not out there for you to pursue. Happiness exists, and frankly, Christians should be experiencing it. I think that the New Testament is clear that uh, the, the resting place for the needle of a Christian, our needle should be resting on peace and joy, contentment. I mean, yes, there's going to be times of mourning. You all know I know that. And there's going to be times where you struggle with depression, and I definitely know that. And uh, when those times come, I just encourage you, if, if you struggle with depression, full court press. I mean, don't, don't let it win, please. The only, the only unbiblical wrong way to fight tradition, uh, depression is to not fight it. F- you know, fight, fight it, get healthy. But beyond that, the, the typical normative Christian position is peace is joy, is contentment. And the reason for that is because we have everything we need. The Apostle Paul says, I have learned to be content. As long as I have shelter, clothing, and food, I'm content. Leonard Skinner says, forget your lust for rich man's gold, because all you need is in your soul. If the Apostle Paul and Leonard Skinner agree, I think we're right. I think we're on good footing. So let's uh, stand and read what the Apostle Paul says to us about contentment and how to gain it. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 19, hear the word of the Lord. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, 
and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life into which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be the honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Thus far the reading of God's Word. All men are like grass, and all of our glory is like the flowers of the field. And the grass withers, and flowers fall, but not God's Word. God's Word stands forever. You may be seated. The the needle, the the standard resting position for the Christian ought to be joy and peace and contentment. If we don't experience that, there's a reason why. It could be um, envy, like like, um, Jonathan preached on a few weeks ago. Envy is the the belief that when I get so-and-so, I'll be fulfilled. It could be anxiety. Um, It could be regret. Regret is the belief that God got something wrong. Anxiety is the belief that God's going to get it wrong just as soon as he can. As soon as he can mess this up, he will. Contentment is the belief that we have everything we need in Christ. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is how nothing on this earth fulfills us because the promise of happiness is just always just out of reach. And honestly, the happier people on the earth are the people who haven't gotten that thing yet because they at least get to live under the, under the deluded lie that when they get it, they will be happy. I mean, the, the most miserable people, the people I mentioned, are the people who got all that stuff And they were still empty. They were still unfulfilled. And so their lives turned miserable and broken. Um, Discontentment, for the Christian, discontentment comes from taking a good thing. God surrounded us with so many good things. But when we make a good thing the ultimate thing, When we make the good thing the thing that we must have, that we are incomplete without, discontentment begins to grow in our hearts. We begin to get angry with God. Why are you withholding this? We get angry at ourselves. Why do I keep failing to get this? We get angry with the people around us. Why are you standing in my way? Discontentment is that That taking a a good thing, wealth, it's it's a good thing. Paul tells us how to use it. To the rich in the world, he didn't say, you know, go beat yourselves up and throw yourselves into a ditch, you're awful. He said, use your, your riches to bless. Be generous. But for those, it's typically those who don't have wealth, think when I just get there, if I could just make, now I remember the day I thought if I could just make 30000 a year, man, I'd have everything I needed. I, I do make that now. Um, and I do have everything I need, but it's not the reason. Uh, beauty, a good thing. Song of Solomon is a, a, a long poem that Solomon writes about the beauty of his wife. Beauty is a good thing. But it's fleeting. You probably look the best you're ever going to look right now. You'll probably look a little bit worse tomorrow. 
and so on and so forth until your glory falls and your grass withers. It's fleeting. You can't keep it. <laughs> Y'all are terrible. Um, I was thinking about going bald when I said that. Um, children. And children are great. I, love, I, I loved my kids. Bianca and I were talking about this last night, actually. We were sitting. The house is quiet. You know, there's a period between, like, the boys doing their summer things, and they come home for a couple weeks, and then they go to college, and they went to college. And we're like, it's fun having an empty house, isn't it? And then Bianca felt guilty, and she said, well, I miss my kids. I said, yeah, but we don't have kids anymore. Yeah, sure. Eight-year-olds were great. If I could trade in my 20-year-olds for eight-year-olds, I'd probably do that. But kids grow up, and kids disappoint, and kids make terrible decisions, and they break your heart daily. Marriage. We talked about this at length last week, so I'm not going to go that much into it, but what we discovered last week, what we talked about last week, is that, yes, being single is always hard, and sometimes it's devastating, And marriage is always hard, and sometimes it's devastating. And I don't care how great your marriage is, it's going to end in one of two places. You're either going to get divorced, or your spouse is going to die, or you're going to die. And both of those are terrible. I went and I made a new friend last week, and um, while I was in her bedroom talking to her, she mentioned her husband and how she always has her husband with her, and then she pointed to the urn on the bedside table. I was like, oh, I guess you kind of do. I think she would, you know, trade that. Success, you know, status. Once you get there, you find that it only brings more responsibility. There's this, this great lie that so many of my friends have lived under, at least for a time, this, this thought that, okay, well, I have to work you know, 60 hours a week right now so that I can get promoted. And when I do, then I can have a normal, healthy work-life balance. And I don't know of a promotion that requires less hours of work. I'll be honest. It could be out there. I haven't seen it yet. Um, so j- just, you can quit lying. And for those of us who pretty much have what we need for a comfortable life, then the worry becomes security. Security. What would that even mean? That I don't lose anything I have. That I don't, my children don't grow up and disappoint me. That no one I love gets hurt. That nothing I have gets taken away. I, um, I, I know a woman and man in uh, the Mississippi Delta who there was a prediction that, the Mississippi, that Mississippi was about to have a cataclysmic earthquake. Uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, it was a prediction based on planet alignment. It didn't happen. But uh, it, was suppo- it was going to be the, great, the biggest earthquake in history. Everybody I knew had like tents out behind their house. It was kind of like Y2K, but weirder. People had tents out behind their house, bottles of water, cans. Y'all may remember that, I bet. It was, it was, it was strange because most of us, a lot, I would say a full third of people were convinced this was going to happen. And uh, a friend of mine, he wanted to drive across the Mississippi River to get to Arkansas, and his wife just absolutely would not let him because the earthquake might happen when they were on the bridge. And so he finally, he just talked to her and talked to her, and, and finally she said, okay, if we all wear life vests and we tie ourselves together so we don't lose anybody, we can do it. And so they put on their life vest, tied a rope around each of them, drove across the bridge. And when he got to the other side of the bridge, he said, you know, that all that would have meant was we would absolutely drown. Like, <laughs> what, what that meant was we weren't getting out of this car, not in the best case scenario. You know, so you, you, security, holding on to it. None of those things are real. None of those things actually can be held. None of them fulfill us. And the most important reason why none of them fulfill us is you were created for so much more. The reason why you think those things can fulfill you is you haven't begun to scratch the surface of who you are. 
You are the image of the immortal God. You were created for Him. All those other things that you are looking to to fulfill you, they were just created for you. You weren't created for them. They're just for you to enjoy. They're for you to use to bless other people. They're not ever meant to satisfy you. You were meant for so much more. You are the image of the immortal God. You are, uh, let me say this. I, this is um, the bulletin from Tim Keller's funeral. If you want, would like it, I would be glad to share it with you. It's beautiful. And he has this quote in it it's, uh, from C.S. Lewis. He says, he will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. A bright and stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly his own boundless power and delight and goodness. The process will be long and and in parts very painful. But that is what we are in for. Nothing less. Nothing less. You're created to be immortal. You're created to be glorious. The the existence we now know is is a flimsy, almost see-through dream compared to what we have before us. We're created to be temples of the living God temples of the living God. And and that's what I want you to to see and to think about and meditate on. What what do you already have? If you want to deal with this discontentment, if you want to deal with this lack of joy, if you want to deal with this lack of peace, then meditate on what you already have. You are Christ in you. See, and this is hard, but we're going to spend a lot of time talking about it this fall. God um, could not dwell with men, with humans, once they were sinful, right? And so he cast Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. You know that story. And he begins working with them because that was his desire. His desire was to dwell with us. And so he begins working with them. And, and soon, not long after, uh, well, when, once he calls Moses, he has them build a tabernacle. And the tabernacle is filled with the glory of God. And because it is filled with the glory of God, only Moses was allowed to go in. And there was like a big tornado of of glory in it. uh, Big enough that the entire uh, nation of Israel could be shaded by its cloud in this day and, and be lit up and warmed by its fire at night. And and they they dwelt with that for years until uh, David comes along and he asks to build a temple, and Solomon builds a temple. And, and uh, once the temple is finally built, the glory of God falls on it. Solomon dedicates it, and the glory of God f- falls on it and fills it, right? And the, the priests have to leave. They have to run out of there. They can't st- it's too great. They can't stand to be in the presence of this glory that, that fills it. And, and we get, it wasn't always like that. Priests did have to go in and out, and they did make sacrifices there. And, uh, but there, we have different glimpses of, of times when, when God filled it. Remember, Isaiah went to the temple, and he opens the door, and he walks in, and he sees the fullness of God. The train of his robe fills the temple. He's hidden by great smoke. He's got angels singing out to him, Holy, holy, holy. And, and Isaiah can't stand to be in the presence of it. And he, he cries out, Oh no, woe is me, I'm undone. And the angels come to him and take away his sin and allow him to stand before the Lord's presence. Get a sense of that. Try to just imagine a light that's so bright that you would have to flee flee from this room. Now hear what the Apostle Paul says about you. He says that he is praying for you that you would know God in all his fullness. Uh, Ephesians 3. Ephesians, yeah, 3. Sorry. I don't have it marked. I want to read it to get it just right. Uh, 
I want, I'm praying for you that you'd be strengthened in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints the presence, the, the breadth, the length, the height and depth of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be, full, be filled with all the fullness of God. Why do you have an aching, yearning void within you? You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are designed to have the fullness of God within you. And our calling is for us to walk around like that until we bring blessing and the fullness of God into every setting we walk into so that eventually this entire earth is sanctified and the fullness of God can dwell amongst us again. And we can see him face to face. You need to meditate on that. It's so easy to forget that. It's so easy to just kind of go, yeah, 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 fullness of God. But what I really need is a peanut butter sandwich. Don't lie if I say that to myself every night at 930. (laughs) The fullness of God dwells in you. And, And we are becoming more and more beautiful and and transformed into his image just by beholding his glory. That That is what we have. And if we realize that, we realize we have everything. What does it say in the the call to worship? He's he says, keep your life free from the law of money. Be content with what you have what you have. Why? Because he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Why should you be content? You have God. You have Him. I heard this story um, years and years ago about uh, a landowner who had just enormous property and dams and um, fields and animals and houses and barns, and his son was just uh, a ne'er-do-well, lazy um, irresponsible boy who who just had squandered everything he'd ever had. And so as he was getting older, he called his son in and said, Son, I'm I'm not going to live too much longer, and I want you to know that I've just rewritten my will. And in the will, I I said you can have one thing. I've identified that you can have one thing. You can have any, any of our fields. You can have the horses. You can have the cattle. You can have the sheep. You can have the barn. You can have the house. You can have... The, the guest house, you can have one thing, but I'm giving everything else to Sam because Sam has served me faithfully. He has managed this farm. He, he's served me faithfully his entire life, and I know that I can entrust it to him. And lots of people make their living from this farm, and, and if it goes into the ground, their, their lifestyle, their, their livelihood is going to go down with it, and it needs to be maintained. So I'm giving everything to Sam. And the son looks at him and goes, wait a minute. You're giving me one thing. Yeah. And you're giving our servant everything else. Yes, I'm giving everything else to Sam. And I get to pick one thing, and you give me that one thing, whatever it is. He said, yeah. He said, I guess I'll take Sam. Because if I get Sam, I get it all. And that's the gospel, that once we take Christ, once we receive him, once we know him, we've got it all. And we can believe that whatever it is that that we don't have, those things that are just out of reach, they are just out of reach because the Lord of the universe, who loves us so much that he gave his only son for us, doesn't think we need them right now. And whatever it is that he's given us, we know that he has given it to us because the Lord of the universe, the all-wise, mighty God of the universe, who loves you so much that he gave his own son to you, he wanted you to be the steward of that right now. And then that begins to transform our life. And so we, we go into this day-to-day battle of, of enjoying what we have without becoming slaves to it. In the Apostle Paul, in Philippians 4, he says that he's learned the secret. He says, I'm not talking about being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, 
and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can be in any circumstance, abundance or need, and be content. And, and how does he do that? I, as you read his story, you realize that he, he poured out everything that he had for others. And I really do think that's the key. You see, you can't practice a negative. You really can't. If you want to just destroy somebody's golf swing, like me, if you want to just, like if I, in, in the unlikely occurrence that we're playing golf and I'm winning, um, all you have to do is go, Ricky, you just don't look relaxed. Could you relax just a little bit? I'll spend the rest of the day going, am I relaxed? Am I, am I relaxed now? Because relaxation is just the opposite of tension, right? And so I'm like swinging my club like this. And relax. You can't practice a negative. You can't go around life going, am I being greedy? Am I thinking about money too much? But you can practice generosity. You can assume that the money you have is there to bless others. And it's so cool when you begin to think that way. I, I love uh, certain characters who obviously can do things we can't, right? Shaquille O'Neal, bigger, larger than life in every possible way. But he has a rule, and his rule is it, every time he goes into a store, he has to buy something for someone else before he'll buy something for himself. And it's just so cool to watch him, you know, go into a Walmart and go up to a kid and go, you think your mama let me buy you a bike? You need a bike. And the kid's freaked out, right? And it's, it's like the greatest moment of his life. And long after he's wrecked that bike and outgrown it, he's going to remember the day that Shaquille O'Neal gave him a bike. Like, if you could do that, wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you make somebody that happy? If you can bless somebody with what you have, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Um, if pride is your problem, you could think around, think, go around thinking to yourself, am I thinking about myself? Am I thinking of myself too much? I think I am thinking about myself. Am I thinking about myself right now? I think it must be because I'm thinking about myself. So I wonder if I'm thinking about myself too highly. The answer is yes. Think about other people. Uh, serve other people. Give, give yourself, just be looking at other people and, and asking yourself, Lord, how, why have you put them in my life right now? I was getting stretched at Stretch Lab the other day. I'm at that age where I can't even stretch myself. And uh, this sweet girl who was stretching, we were talking, and she was talking about her morning and how her, and she was just thought it was funny, like her car broke down, and so she had to take an Uber to work, and then she forgot her, she forgot her purse, and she had to Uber back to the house and then back to work, and then um, we quickly did the calculations, and I said, are you going to make enough money in this day of work to pay for that Uber? And she goes, I don't know. And I had money in my pocket, and so I gave it to her. Why not? I had plenty. I had a car. My car has gas in it. I didn't have to Uber to work that day. Why wouldn't you? Serve somebody else. That's what Jesus said. He said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. If, if work is your issue, sit down with your wife and just set the hours. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Take a day of rest. Take one day a week when you're not going to work. And if if your job won't allow that, you might need to find another one. If your spouse is just not everything you think she ought to be or everything you think he ought to be, stop trying to manipulate them to make yourself happy. And start trying to serve them. Serve them with your body, as the Apostle Paul says. Serve them with your whole self. Paul Tripp tells a story of a couple that went, uh, went to a counselor, and the counselor said, y'all need to start having a date night. And I uh, said, all right, we're going to have a date night. And so the husband uh, reserves a suite at the nicest hotel in Philadelphia, and they're at this, getting this really expensive dinner. And, you know, as the main course comes, the wife's been kind of looking for a time, and finally she says, well, don't you think it's time we kind of started talking about some of the things we do to hurt each other? And he stands up and yells, I'm spending hundreds of dollars on you tonight, and you want to ruin it by talking about that? He wasn't spending anything on her. He was spending it on himself. 
He wanted her to make him happy. And so he's trying to trade off some of his money to, to get that. Look and see what your spouse actually needs. I just read the coolest book. I'm, I know you're sick of hearing about it already, but uh, How to Stay Married by Harrison Scott Key. I'm going to keep talking about it until you've read it. And he, he just you know, has a chapter where he talks about, hey, I knew I wasn't a perfect husband, but I was pretty good. And then you read the chapter that his wife wrote, and she says, I was miserable. For 10 years, I was absolutely miserable, and he never once noticed. Actually care about the other person. Don't raise your children to be marks of pride for you. I know that feeling. I know how bad it makes you look when your kids act up at church. You think nobody actually cares. Nobody. But you do. And we're, we're tempted to make our children perform. And if they don't perform, we get embarrassed. You know. And the kids are just interested in the bugs on the ground and the leaves on the sidewalk. And they don't care about making you look good by saying hi to the pastor. And that is okay. That is them being what they ought to be. It may not make you look good, but it's them being what they ought to be. If we want to be great, be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. The happiest people I've ever known in my life were custodians. They really are. They still are. I don't know why. I think it may be because they get just a real concrete joy out of exactly what Jesus said. The greatest of us all have come to serve. D.L. Moody says that in the world we, gr we count greatness by how many people you have serving under you. But in the kingdom of God we count greatness by how many people you've served. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we confess that we have taken these, these tools that you've given us to bless other people. And we've exalted them into little baby gods and wondered why they haven't made us feel fulfilled and happy and content. Will you show us the lies that we believe? And will you enable us to practice generosity and service and kindness? And all those different words that all really just come into the definition of love. What does it mean to love our neighbor as we love ourselves? What does it mean to love you with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind? We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to sing uh, Be Thou My Vision, a great song about the very thing that we just uh, talked about. And then I will answer your questions. Uh, if you have any, please text them in. I've already gotten one, so you better hurry if you want to get in line. And uh, please stand as we sing.
Please be seated. There's only a few questions, so it won't take too long today. Make up for holding you late last time. So, um, first off is one I do want to address because I know some people were confused by it last week, and I just want to be very clear. Um, were you saying last week that we don't need a personal relationship with, with Christ? Absolutely not. I, I, what I was trying to say, and obviously failed at it, was that in order for you to experience the fullness of of a healthy life, a healthy spiritual life, now in this world, you need to be in the church. You need to be, that's what the church is for. Uh, we are the body of Christ. If you want to be united to him and live a life united to him, or that you need to be part of that body, joined to him through the ligaments and the blood vessels and all the things that are mentioned in Colossians. If you want to be, you need to be part of his uh, blood and uh, bones, part of his flesh and bones. Um, as listed in uh, Ephesians 5, but all that starts with your personal relationship with Jesus. Um, you can't have a relationship with the church without being a, uh, one with Christ first. So that's, that's where it starts. I'm sorry if I was unclear. Second, how can I serve one, someone well when they seem willing to hurt me? Uh, letting somebody hurt you is not serving them. Um, actually, you're, you're allowing them to sin, and you never want to allow someone to sin. And so it is uh, very necessary to set up correct boundaries to help people be healthy. Somebody who wants to hurt people is, is sinning and is broken, and they need to know what health looks like. And so um, if it's your boss, if it's somebody at work, um, if it is your spouse and they are hurting you, then you need to find a healthy boundary, and that may mean withdrawing for a time, uh, explaining what is and is not okay. Um, that is serving somebody. It's not, if, if an alcoholic comes to you begging uh, for a bottle of whiskey, getting him a bottle of whiskey is not serving him. Telling him that, you know, you need water and life and freedom from this addiction is serving him. Serving people is not always giving them what they want. Um, I would say it's giving them what they want about half the time. Um, but, you know, without knowing the specifics, I can't really jump into that one much more than that. For those of us who are prone to people-pleasing or codependency, how do we keep our motives for serving others on God rather than on trying to earn others' approval or failure? And again, I think the same thing. You need to take a step back, and, and this is why you need the body of Christ, and you need advice sometimes, and you need to be willing to accept that advice. You know, my 30-year-old son keeps showing up asking for money and leaving. Uh, somebody else, not you, you'll always make the wrong decision. Somebody else needs to step in and go, well, may, maybe we need to find out what he's doing with that money and decide whether it's actually the safest and best thing to do to give it to him. Um, so... You know, you set your motives on just loving the Lord and loving the person. Codependency is, is convoluted, and we've got professionals in the room who can talk to you, but essentially you're, you're loving yourself by doing whatever it takes to get this person to approve of you. It's like being a, 
you know, going through hazing in a fraternity and letting them dump paint all over you because you want them to think you're a great pledge. Like, that's not really it. Um, you, don't, you don't do things for others so that you feel better for yourself. Um, you do them because you're actually trying to help that person. Again, it's hard to talk about that without specifics. If you think you're in that boat, then, in, then surround yourself with wise people and, and talk through the, the issues with them. Um, that's probably the best advice I can give you. And finally, sometimes I feel like complaining about our parenting is keeping us from experiencing contentment. But it also feels like it's healthy to be honest about our struggles. Can you help? Is it just a balance? Yeah, I think, um, I think there is this belief that all parents have that if we were perfect, our kids would be perfect. And therefore, since they're not perfect, we're not perfect. And it's always, it's always easy to beat ourselves up. And, and God doesn't want you to beat yourself up. Um, and so I would say two or three things about that. One is nobody in here is a bad parent. Okay, y'all are all great. You're in the top 5% of parents in the world. I know a lot of bad parents. I know what they look like. You're not bad parents, okay? If I thought you were being a bad parent, I would tell you, you're great. Y'all are fine. Uh, you really are. And you're, all you can do, you have to minimize your expectations. You can't, it's not your job to turn your child into a Harvard grad who's, you know, captain of the football team. Um, and if and those are your expectations, which they were mine, they really were. And I had to lower those and be, okay, all I can do is provide my children with a safe place to grow up so that they feel secure and loved. That's it. I know there's a whole lot more you think you can do. You really can't. Give your children a safe place to grow up where they feel secure and loved, and you're in the 99th percentile. That's all you got to do. If you're a dad, your life is so easy. Come home at night, don't scream at anybody, don't hit anybody. That's kind of it. Mom does all the hard work, heavy lifting. You just kind of provide the, you know, overarching thing. Just don't hit anybody. Come home at night. I'll narrow it down to two. I'll let you yell from time to time. Uh, Not too often. But you really... um, And the other thing, we just kind of expect perfection from ourselves. Um, and, and, and we're perfected in Christ, not in parenting. So you are perfect. You're not what you think you ought to be. All right, what practical thing can one do when they know that more, ultimate, more things will not make them happy to move to living as more things? What practical things can one do when they know that more things will not ultimately make them happy? to move to living as more things don't make them happy. Uh, Jesus said, sell something and give it to the poor. I think that's a great idea, actually. Uh, The next time you want to go buy something for yourself, don't. (laughs) Buy something for somebody else instead. Um, I I think that that actually kind of frees you up. Um, And you have to kind of figure out what it is, right? I know people, I know one person who went a year without listening to an Ole Miss football game on the radio because that was his ultimate thing. Uh, I know people who've decided to go a, a year without buying clothes because that was their ultimate thing. Um, you, know, if you, you, you probably need to sit down with someone who's close to you and discuss what, what's our ultimate thing and how can we uh, change that for the glory of God. So I want you to know freedom in that. 1015, please stand. You have everything in Christ. The Lord your God is in your midst, and he is mighty to save. He rejoices over you with gladness. He quiets you with his love, and he exults over you with loud singing. Amen. One more is next week. Bring good questions.